So, Matthew chapter 6. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Now, just to say, this is Jesus speaking. This is the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon in history. And uh, this is just a a middle section in that uh, longer uh, passage. Verse 2, carrying on. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we can come before you now. We thank you for these precious words from your Son. We thank you for the extraordinary invitation they contain and the wonderful privilege they allude to. And we thank you for your Spirit's presence amongst us. We look to you that you would draw near to us in these moments speak to our hearts and help us to sense that wonderful invitation into fellowship with God that is present here. We pray that we would step forward into that fellowship and increasingly every one of us, everyone who hears my voice, Lord I pray let all of us come into a deepening, ever sweeter, ever stronger fellowship with God. We pray, Lord, let that strengthen us. Let that do us good. Let that bring you great glory in and through our lives. I pray for your help in speaking. I pray for your help for each one here in hearing. I ask that you'd speak to us and glorify your name amongst us. In Jesus' name I pray. I just encourage you to take a moment to ask God to speak to you this morning. Just uh, go ahead and in your own heart, you invite God to speak to you and do your best to open your heart to what he might want to say. Well, I'm not going to cover all of uh, what I just read. There's a lot of content there. And uh, just to draw out some of the broad themes before then homing in on one particular theme, the broad sweep of what Jesus is talking about here has to do with our practicing of our righteousness, our practicing of our spirituality, our living our Christian lives, being something that isn't uh, merely for show. It's not meant to be a superficial thing. I came across someone saying the secret of true religion is religion in secret. 
I thought it was quite a helpful way of putting it. The secret of religion, the secret of true religion, is religion in secret. If there is nothing to your faith beyond uh, what happens externally and publicly, if there's nothing that happens between you and God in private, there is a sense in which uh, you're missing out. That uh, we can live quite spiritually impoverished lives if there's no secret component to them. If there's no drawing near to God in your own fellowship with him. And what Jesus describes here in this passage uh, alludes to that in a number of ways. That as believers, we have this invitation into personal fellowship with God. Without question, there's a crucially important part of our faith, which is a corporate aspect. Our being together as God's people is vitally important. It's not an either or. We don't either do it in secret or do it in public. But we will live impoverished lives if there isn't a secret component. There's something about our actually having our own fellowship with God and knowing him at a personal level that Jesus is inviting us into. And he wants us to be wary of the idea of doing anything merely for show. And so he talks about three different ways where we need to be careful that we don't do something at a merely external level. Firstly, you see in verse 2, he says, when you give to the needy, don't sound a trumpet, blah, 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 look at me, I'm giving away. Now, it seems that perhaps that was actually happening, that literally some people were so impressed with themselves, they'd have someone kind of blast off a thing and look everyone, I give to the needy. And it's like, oh, well done, you aren't you amazing? I'm reminded of the kind of children in need thing when these banks and groups come with these enormous checks and they're like, oh, look at this. It's kind of like, that's not really the point. Let everyone look how great I am. So he said, don't, don't make a big deal of how you give. Uh, don't make it a public thing. Secondly, he says, when you pray, verse 5, you must not be like the hypocrites. They love to be seen praying. And then thirdly, in verse 16, he says, and when you fast, don't do it in this kind of, oh, I'm fasting, everyone, kind of making a show of it. No, these things, you're giving, you're praying, you're fasting. This is very much between you and God. You don't need to advertise the fact that you're fasting. You don't need to advertise your prayers or your giving. This is something between you and God. Now, I'm going to home in on the prayer part of this. I'm looking at this, this middle one. But just before I do, just to quickly clock that with regards to giving, it is worth pointing out, because I do want to at least let these verses kind of uh, land with us, that this giving thing, you know, it says when you give to the needy. It doesn't say if. My dad said this. It's always stuck with me. He said, regardless of how you understand the interpret, you know, how you interpret the, the scriptures teaching on giving, it is undoubtedly the will of God that you are seriously committed to giving away money. I think that much can be said with real certainty. <laughs> it is undoubtedly the will of God that you are seriously committed to giving away money. So much of Jesus' teaching has to do with giving away money. And uh, for all I know, you're all brilliant at that. Yeah, I don't know you. I don't know your, 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 your bank balance. <laughs> and, uh, but just to put that before you, Jesus' teaching often homes in on this aspect of financial giving. And it is God's will for us to be committed to giving away money. So whether, you know, some people say, oh, tithing is old covenant. It doesn't apply anymore. You know, I tend to see tithing as a good place to start. The new covenant should, you know, the new Testament, the new covenant. I'm not going to go into all the detail of that. But what we have now as believers tends to supersede that which was in the old covenant. So if they were happy with the principle of a tithe and we go, we're new covenant, so we give away 1%, then I think we're missing something. Yeah. So I would urge you to be at least tithing. Uh, and looking to be significantly committed to giving away money. This seems to be Jesus' clear teaching. So that's one thing I would simply say, that uh, that's, that's something for us to be committed to. And it, it does also allude to the reward of that, that he will bless when we give. There will be a response from God. He who sows generously will reap generously, is what it says in 2 Corinthians 8. And so I would encourage you to take that very seriously. And maybe that some of you, that's something you need to act on as a result of today. Think, okay, am I committed to giving away money? Do I have a standing order where I give money to the church? Do I, it's easy for me to say this because I'm not the leader of the church, yeah? Much easier for me to say this. But I have a standing order, you know, we just, our 10% just goes out as a beginning point. That's what, you know, goes out every month. It's a good thing to do. It's a, it's a great place to be. Okay, so on giving, that's all I'm going to say on that one. And then on fasting, just quickly, and then we'll come back, as I say, and focus on prayer. Again, on the fasting, it does say when you fast, not if. That's again, it's interesting. Jesus is speaking to his followers when you fast. Again, some people say, oh, you know, fasting is kind of Old Testament, isn't it? Well, no, evidently, Jesus is speaking to his followers when you fast. 
So evidently, he, there's an expectation that that will be in our lives, that we will fast. Now, there's no specifics as to how and when exactly and for how long and all that kind of stuff. But it's good to have it as something that you do with a measure of regularity, I suppose. Jesus seems to be implying that in the way that he's saying this. And so fasting is something that Jesus seems to expect us to be committed to doing as well. And just to say on this one, I've got two things to say about fasting. Firstly, he says, when you fast, you do it to be seen by your Father in heaven, not to be seen by others. And I've often found that helpful. Someone pointed out, when you fast, say that to God. See me. See me in my fasting. I'm not looking for anyone else's view. It shouldn't be that they even necessarily know. That should be essentially a private thing between you and God. But when you fast, do as it were, be overt about it before God. I've often said that to God at fasting. God, see me in my fasting. I am doing this deliberately. Jesus said to do it. There's a sense in which it seems to add strength to our prayers in a mysterious way. It's difficult to explain exactly how and why that works. But evidently it does. And so I've often said, God, see me. See me in my fasting. I do this before you. I want want your attention. (laughs) I want you to see this matters to me. And oftentimes, and this is the the last thing I'm going to say on fasting, it does say there will be a reward. And some of you, I'm sure, could tell stories of the rewards you've experienced where it comes to fasting. Situations where I've prayed and fasted and something has happened. You say, wowzers. I'll tell you just one story because I can't resist. Sorry. Um... I tried uh, in my early 20s to do a three-day fast. I thought, right, I'm going to fast for three days about such and such. And at the time, I can't even remember what I was fasting about, but at the time it all seemed terribly important. And, uh, and so I had this big deal, and I'm bringing it to God, and I'm fasting. I'm like, God, please, please give me breakthrough in this thing. Now, I'm trying to fast for three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. On the second day, I was hungry. Okay. <laughs> And it came to the the, uh, Saturday afternoon, and my cousin was living with us, and I said to her, I'm really, really hungry. And she said, then why don't you eat something? And and these mysterious horns grew out of her head, and this little tail came out. No, not really. Um, But she said, why don't you eat something? And I thought, that's a good idea. And, uh, And I ate something, and then I felt awful. I was like, oh, you loser. You were supposed to be fasting for three days. What a loser. And I kind of, you know, caved in on the second day. And then after that, I'm like, oh, woe is me. God, God doesn't love me anymore. And, and I'm kind of all despondent. I go to church the next morning, which was supposed to be day three, you know. And um, <clears throat> with a full tummy, I go to church and a, and a heavy heart. And, uh, and everyone's, you know, worshipping. And I just thought, I can't join in because evidently God's in heaven going, oh, it's that boy again. That boy who didn't complete his fast is there. Yeah, I can see him. I want to see that boy. Yeah. And I just feel like totally kind of condemned and heavy hearted. And while the worship is happening, now it's big church in Brighton where I grew up. I about 700 people, big auditorium. And, uh, and while everyone else is worshipping, I'm just silently saying to God, God, please tell me that you heard me. Because the thing I was praying about was a big deal. Please tell me that you heard me. I know I caved in. I know I failed. But please tell me that you heard me. Now, I'm just kind of whispering that under my breath, saying it in my heart to God. At the end of the meeting, a guy who's on the other side of the room who had an extraordinary gift of prophecy, he comes to me and he says, uh, he says Simon, I, I think God's given me a verse he wants me to share with you. Is that all right? I'm like, yeah, of course. He says, it's Daniel chapter 10, verse 12. It says this, Don't be afraid. From the first day that you set your mind to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to them. Now, I've told that story so many times, and it's something I have personally recalled with God in private so many times. You told me, you heard me. I believe you're hearing me now. It's an awesome privilege. A moment like that when you say, God, please tell me you heard me. And he says, I heard you. He says, Wow, it didn't just say, I heard you, it said from the first day. Yeah, <laughs> you tried to fast for three days, from the first day, your words were heard. That's breathtaking. Now, sometimes fasting has, in, in my life, in my experience, it's just sometimes it breaks things open in a way that, that praying doesn't always happen in quite the same way. It adds muscle, it adds weight in some strange way. I can't begin to pretend to understand it. But uh, there's a reward. There is a reward. Jesus says there'll be a reward. So it's, it's worth doing. Okay? So that's the giving and the fasting. Now, what I want us to do in the, in the remainder of the time is really home in on prayer. And what we see, uh, particularly uh, in these verses, it starts in verse 5, is Jesus warns us of uh, a couple of dangers and gives us some real encouragements as to what's going to help us in our praying. 
Okay? So let's look at verse 5. He says, When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they've received their reward. But when you pray, and here's the thing, this is where I really want us to get an understanding of. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, I had this outline and everything, and I kind of thought I'm supposed to maybe abandon it. <laughs> but um, I'll just tell you it very quickly, and then I'll go with what I think God wants me to go with. <laughs> Jesus is saying to them, there are those who, when they pray, you, you, they're seeking the wrong thing. They want the reward of people looking at them and going, oh, wow, you pray. Oh, I heard that. Did you hear his praying? It was very good. Mm, yes. And that's all they're seeking. And Jesus says it's possible to seek that reward. And he says, if you want, do it. That, you get it. Yeah, that's your reward. You received your reward in full. If you want men and women to look at you and go, wow, she can really pray. He can really pray. If, if you want that, go for it. Yeah? Yeah, and you can tell he's not saying it's very good. He's saying, if you want that reward, it's available. If you want the reward of people thinking you're great, well, what do you do? It's there for you. Yeah? It's kind of like you can do that if you want. But Jesus is saying there's something much more glorious that's available. The praise of men and women is pff, it's nothing. It's a breath. It's here and it's gone. To be thought of as a big deal by people is immaterial. It doesn't last. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't amount to much. And so Jesus is saying, don't seek that. That's, that's here and then it's gone. It lasts as long as the, the applause, the echo is collapsed. It's like, well, that was, what was that for? Is that it? Is that what you're living for? Jesus says there's something else that's available. Something far more glorious that's available. And he says this, and this, when I heard someone explain this a while ago, it just, it's transformed my life, to be honest. It's something that's stayed with me ever since. And I quote this verse to God probably more than any other verse, to be honest. I come back to this verse, and I pray, and I say it to God on, on probably at least once a day. I'll end up bringing this to God at some point, and I'll say, you said, Jesus, you said, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, speak to your Father who is in secret. And your father, who sees what's in the secret, will reward you. So here I am. Now, here's what he's saying. When I heard someone explain this, it helped me so much. You want to know where God is? He's in secret. He's in your room. Wherever you are and close a door, he's there. He says, that's what Jesus is saying. When you go to your room, close the door, speak to your father, who is in secret. Who, in the NIV it says, who is un unseen. But it's not just that he's unseen, it's that he's there. He's in the secret place. You see, if, if, whenever you go to a closed door and praise your father, who is there? Who is in secret? He's there. God is in your room. He's, he's in your room right now. He is, wh wherever you go and close the door, he's there. You can speak to God. I remember saying to my nephew, uh, when I first was looking at this a while ago, he was about nine years old at the time, my nephew Charlie. And I said to him, Charlie, we were in the garden. I said, if God was going to be in the shed at three o'clock this afternoon and he was going to listen to you if you spoke to him, do you think you'd go? He said, I'd knock the door down. I said, right, we can open the door. He said, I'd still knock the door down. <laughs> so God is going to be there at three o'clock. God, the God who made Jupiter and Pluto and the, the stars and that, that God. Yeah, that's what Jesus is saying. Does Jesus lie? If Jesus is not a liar, and I don't think we're persuaded he is, yeah? If Jesus isn't a liar, then God is in your room. He's not making it up. That is the most awesome, breathtaking thing in the world. That Jesus, the one who is the truth, has given us this awesome promise. When you go into a room and close your door, God's there. He's there. Now, sometimes I've been lying in bed at night, and I'm, and I, and I'm going to sleep, and it suddenly goes through my mind. God's downstairs. If you want to go talk to him, he'll listen. Now, when that has got, it doesn't happen that often, but when it does, I think, oh, he is. God is downstairs. That's what Jesus said. And of course, that'll get me out of bed again. <laughs> I'll go downstairs. I'm like, well, I'm here. Um, <laughs> and so if, if prayer is merely a duty and something we all don't do very well and we all feel rubbish about how badly we do it, that doesn't help motivate us. If God is in your room, 
And he's there. And he's ready to listen. That changes things. I mean, it's just a wonderful thing. Think, God is available. You can pray for the praise of men. Psh, or you can go and be with your father who's available. He is available. He's there. It's just an incredible reality. It's an amazing, amazing thing. And so I want to encourage you with the awareness of that. That's what you're invited into. To come and be with your Father who is in secret. Now, apparently, when it says go into your room and, and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, the, if you look into it, the commentators tend to draw this out. What he's referring to is that most homes in those days wouldn't necessarily have a, you know, a lot of room. Some of you would think, oh, this is all well and good if you've got a room. Yeah, I live in a house with lots of people. difficult to find a room. Well, I understand that. Apparently, Susanna Wesley, who's the mother of John and Charles Wesley, quite a big deal, who made a big difference in our country's history, um, she, the way she would apply this text was that she, surrounded with all these kids that she had, she would put a sheet over her head. And she'd say, when mummy has a sheet over her head, it's because she's gone to be with her father in secret. She's praying to God. And she'd just cover herself with a sheet, and the kids knew, oh, you don't disturb mummy when she's doing that. And so she'd be in the same room as the others, because they didn't have another room. She's sitting there, a sheet over her head, and she's speaking to God. And they know, don't disturb mummy when she's doing that. There's different ways we can apply this. But apparently in the original context, they would talk about a room which would be the place where you'd keep your valuables, your treasures, your, your closet. It's where the terminology of a prayer closet comes from. So it's your kind of wardrobe type, not a big room, just a place. And it's like he's saying, you know the room where you keep your treasure? Well, let me tell you about the sweetest treasure there is. The greatest treasure there is is your fellowship with your father. That's the thing that's your deepest treasure. So you go into that room and you, you experience the treasure of fellowship with God, talking to your Father. Now, he's available. Second thing he says here is don't be like the, uh, the, the Gentiles. He said, don't be like the hypocrites, those who just go on. Now, speak to your Father who's in secret. It's verse 7, and when you pray, do not, secondly, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So he seems to be saying at this point, so don't be like those who make a show of it because that's, that's seeking the wrong thing. There's a real reward. God is available. You can know him in secret. Secondly, don't be like those who merely babble away and say lots of stuff and think, oh, God's bound to do it because I'm saying enough stuff. So well, no, you don't have to just say lots of words as though somehow you're going to kind of crowbar a blessing out somehow with lots of words, 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 words. words. Now, you come to, it says, the one who knows what you need before you ask. Now, we might think, if he knows what I need, why bother asking? You know, that's how we tend to read something. Like that. I think he knows what I need. Well, what's the point? Now, the point that Jesus seems to be making is he knows you. He knows you. And he's got everything you need. And he's ready to meet all your needs. Because he knows you. Whenever we go anywhere, be it a walk around the block, my lovely wife will insist on bringing snacks and drinks for the kids i'm like they don't need them yeah <laughs> i grew up with with ruthless parents who rarely fed me evidently um but no i uh, no, we with snacks and drinks was just like go find a puddle you know i did, it wasn't quite as bad as that but um i just i was just like did they get thirsty they'll have a drink when we get home but my wife is so conscientious about yeah but i want to make sure i want to make sure she's thinking of their needs before they do when they're then hungry, it's like, well, yeah, we're prepared because she thinks that way. Our, our Father in heaven, he knows our needs before we have them. And so we're to come to him in the knowledge, you know everything I need. I don't have to pry this out of your hand. I'm coming to one who is a need-meeting God. He's, he's a satisfier. He knows how to satisfy you. He is satisfying. And he gives to us so, so richly. And so he is available. He is satisfying. He's a, fellowship with him is available. Fellowship with him is satisfying. And then thirdly, just the thing just to point out is that he's kind. He's a father, Jesus goes on to say. He's a father. So if he's available and satisfying and kind, there you go, A-S-K. If he is available, satisfying and kind, ask him. Ask him. Ask him every day. Ask him for things. My children will ask me for things every day. Okay. And I am nowhere near as loving and generous-hearted as our Father in Heaven is, but by and large, they'll get a lot out of me every day by asking. 
They will. And he says, if we bring evil now to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give good gifts? And, and Luke 11, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. He'll give to us. Now, here's this, the last thing I said I was going to, you know, that was my, mainly the thing I was going to go with. But the, what I just feel is so important for us to uh, really get before I close is this thing. Jesus, Jesus had fellowship with the Father. Yeah, Jesus would, he would pray, and it says, it seems that routinely, he would slip off and he'd be alone with the Father. And they're looking, where's Jesus? No one can find Jesus. Where's Jesus gone? And it emerges, and evidently he's been having fa- fellowship with the Father. He's been on his own praying with the Father. If ever there was someone who didn't need to do that, you'd think it would be Jesus, Yeah. I don't know if Jesus would need to pray in the same way as us. He's the Son of God. He's kind of special, yeah? So he is, he is one who doesn't need to. But evidently, Jesus is convinced that God is available, satisfying, and kind. He knows what it is to have fellowship with his Father, not out of obligation, but out of sheer delight, that he thinks, I, I want to be with the Father. That's why he keeps on saying, I, I only do what I see the Father doing. I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. My food is to do his will. My meat and drink is to do his will. I delight to do your will. He wants to walk in the way of the Father. He adores and loves the Father. And so if he's got this fellowship with the Father, you think, oh, to have fellowship with the Father like Jesus had, Yeah. Would you like a prayer life like Jesus's? Do you think that when Jesus spoke to the Father, he was confident that the Father was listening to his voice? Yeah? Do you think that when Jesus prayed, do you think Jesus is praying, they're going, but this doesn't work. But he's not even listening. I bet this isn't going to happen. Jesus, when he prays to the Father, he has got incredible confidence. My Father hears me. And we build our understanding of what will happen in world history based on the things that Jesus prayed. So people say, you know, we know that ultimately the church will become one because Jesus prays for it in John 17. It's there. It's in his high priestly prayer. So we know that this, this, uh, the prayers of Jesus, he prays with confidence he's being answered. Now here's the thing. Here's the thing that I want you to really grasp as we draw this to a close. You want that fellowship with the Father like Jesus had. You would like a prayer life like his. Jesus invites you into exactly that. Precisely that. That's what he makes available to us. See, it says in John, Jesus puts it this way in John 17. He says in verse 22, the glory, talking to the Father, that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me, and listen, listen, and loved them even as you loved me. That's, I, I don't know if there's anything more incredible than that in all that the gospel says, that we are loved He says, even as you love me, you love them. That we are loved by the Father with the same love that he loves his son, the Lord Jesus, with. It's not like he has a love for Jesus, then he has a kind of second-rate love that he gives to you. No, you are loved with the same love that he loves his son with. He invites you into that, into that fellowship with the Father. Jesus offers you his fellowship with the Father. He says, if you want to know him, you can have fellowship with the Father like he did. And so when he's died and come alive again, the thing he says to tell his disciples in John chapter 20, he says to Mary, who sees him after his resurrection, on the morning of the resurrection, he says to her in John chapter 20, verse 17, he says, don't cling to me, I haven't yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers, the disciples, the first time he's referred to them in that way, my brothers, and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father. What I've done in taking all your sin, all your wickedness, all your greed, taking all of that sin and killing it on the cross, dying for it, taking it, dealing with it, leaving it in hell, 
coming out of the grave, bringing you with me into new life. What I have accomplished is I've brought you into the place where you can call my father your father. Now what's available to us because of what Jesus has done is you can pray to the father with the same confidence that Jesus had that you're being heard. That's breathtaking. That's what we now have. We're we're loved with the same love that Jesus is loved with. We're invited into the same place with the Father that Jesus was invited into. And he loves your words like he loved his own sons. And you can speak to him. That doesn't mean we get everything we ask for. Jesus knew how to ask perfectly. (laughs) Yeah, and good fathers say no because they are good, not because they're bad. And there will be occasions when God will say no. And he said no even to his own son, I guess, so many Although Jesus knew that that was going to have to be. <laughs> but there is, he, he is ready to invite your appeals, your requests, your, your prayers. That's what you're invited into. It's awesome. This is what's yours. This is what you can have. You can have this. Fellowship with the Father on the same footing that Jesus had. Because you're in him. Trusting in him. It's his righteousness that qualifies you, loved with the same love. And now when you talk to him, John Calvin said, when you pray, pray as though through Jesus' mouth. So you pray to him thinking, Father, I know you would listen if it was Jesus speaking to you. I'm hidden in your beloved son. And I ask you for this, for that, for this. And you come before him and, and he hears you. I mean, that is an amazing reality. It's just an awesome and glorious thing. So I want to encourage you to make good on this offer he's available, he's satisfying, he's kind and you can have the fellowship with the father that Jesus himself had that's what you're invited into you might not always feel like it but that's what's there, that's the truth otherwise Jesus is a liar Okay, he's not Okay, father we thank you thank you for these dear hearts, these precious people here and your love for them and your desire that they walk into this intimacy and lord your the fact that you love our voice, Lord, more than we love our own children, Lord, that you, you love to hear us. Father, help each one of us to believe this with all our heart and soul and live in the good of the fellowship you've invited us into through your dear son, the Lord Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.